Thank you for joining us on day 13 of your 30-day Dental MBA, The Real Meaning of Continuing Education. As usual, let's do a little review from day 12. Day 12 was your management information system, and that's a good place to start with continuing education because I look at continuing education as internal and external. You know, you could only go so far outside your business looking for answers until you realize one day, as M.T. Asmanji always told me from day one when he first came to my office, he says, Howard, the pot of gold is in your own office. People will drive halfway around the world to continue education, yet they don't study anything in their own dental office. So he said, remember, there's more knowledge to be gained from studying the internal bowels of your own office. And, the, and here's the numbers for uh, soft dent, dentrix. Soft Dent by Dent Supplies, 1-800-443-2409, 1-800-443-2409. Dentrix from Henry Schein is 1-800-472-4346, 472-4346. Eagle Soft with Patterson is 1-800-352-8101, that's 1-800-352-8101. Or call Tom at Practice Outlook at 1-800-247-6173. 1-800-247-6173. Do tell them you watch this, not in the fact that I'm going to get a dime from an opinion, I don't, I don't play those games, but do it so the fact that they realize the market call, that you want these systems hooked up to major banks because you think that a bank will take a huge account of 10,000 dentists if they can get the master charge business, the visa business, the electronic claim business, the financing business. There's a lot of peripheral um, income streams that can be all coordinated through the distribution channel of having 5,000 to 10,000 dental offices all hooked up. And you know, it's hard. You know, financing is like insurance. It's an actuarial risk analysis versus the moral hazard of lying, cheating, declaring bankruptcy. Master Charge and Visa know that they can't issue a credit card. They have to issue a million credit cards because after you issue about a million, Credit card companies know that they're going to lose about less, slightly less than 1% in credit card theft. They know about 3 or 4% of the people are not going to pay their bill back on time in a timely manner. And they know about 12% of the people are going to pay off their whole bill each month. They don't make any money off that. And they make their money on that standard deviation one, that 68.5% that carries this average balance, has a little bit of uh, interest, you know, 1.5% a month, 18% a year. They make their money on the middle. But to spread their risk so they can eat, 0.9 or 1% credit card theft and complete loss, or that 3 to 4% where people delay paying their bills or run late or whatever, versus 12% that paid all off and there's no income stream there. They have to issue a lot of cards before they get a big enough distribution where they can do an actuarial analysis and be profitable. And you know, if every dentist is, let, let's say um, Softin didn't have 11,000 users or 12,000, whatever it is, let's say they had 10,000. If they had 10,000 users, and the average dentist has 2,000 uh, patients. Uh, well, what's 10,000 times 2,000? That's 20 million people. We have enough people right now on either Densply Softin or Henry Shine's Dentrix or Patterson's Eagle Soft, and we got enough almost nearly a trillion dollar banks where we could implement this tomorrow if the CEOs, John Miles of Dent Supply believed in this, if Stan Bergman Shine believed in this, or Pete Bruchetta Patterson believed in this. And uh, those are some sharp, sharp, people so let them know that you're not just a regular dentist that's looking under a microscope looking at his crown and bridge margins and trying to see if he's doing crown and bridge the 50 micron margin let him know that you are a businessman that you understand the value of, of uh, um, installment credit relationships in all relationships understanding the feelings of others is the key to creating stronger relationships you've got to study things like employee turnover you know I want to know that for every year you've been open how many employees did you have on January 1, subtract the, those employees that are still there on December 31st, divided by the number of employees that were there on January 1, times 100, which determines your staff turnover. If you had 50 employees January 1, or I'm not, let's say five employees on January 1, of those, only three of those people were still there at the end of the year, which means two have moved on and been replaced. It'd be five minus three divided by five, which is two over five, times 100 mean you have a 40% staff turnover. Remember, the average 25% of Americans find a new job every year, so the benchmarking average would be uh, your average employee should be there about four years. I say that even though I know that's completely incorrect because it's kind of like um, 
registered nurses. You know, when they set up um, RN schools, they set up the capacity to equal the demand of nurses necessary. But they didn't understand the nature of the ape enough to know that 98.5% of all nurses are women. Well, women have babies. If you have a four-year degree and you're a nurse, you probably married a husband with a four-year degree. He's got a good job. On any given day, two out of every three nurses and two out of every three hygienists are currently not employed. So if, you, if the United States needs 50,000 nurses, they got to make 150,000 of them. So on any given day, they'll have 50,000 working. This is, you know, the same thing about, you know, Ray Kroc um, understood, you know, once again, another billionaire understood the nature of the ape. I remember when my dad started getting into restaurants, we drove from Wichita, Dallas, Texas to hear Ray Kroc speak one day. And Ray Kroc was talking about how um, he knew that there needed to be a consistent franchise product across the United States as they were building the interstates. Remember, the interstates were pretty much built after World War II. And, you know, 1945, there weren't really any interstates. And the Navy, the military um, thought that they needed these interstates to be able to mobilize tanks and jeeps and what have you. And when they were laying out these interstates, that's the first time families started driving halfway across the country, go to Disneyland, Grand Canyon, what have you. And Ray was a keen observer of people. He's about 55 years old before he started McDonald's. And he noticed that as soon as you drove to the next town, no matter what they served you, it wasn't what you expected. Even if you ate your, your favorite dinner, say you had chicken fried steak as your favorite meal, you go to the next restaurant in the next town, order your chicken fried steak, and they'd serve it with green beans, and you'd start complaining, gosh darn, chicken fried steak, green beans, don't you know chicken fried steak's supposed to be the black eyed peas, who the hell, you know, you'd, you'd order eggs, and you'd want grits with it, and they'd give you hash browns, you're like, what the hell's a hash brown, I want my grits. So he said, you know, there's no such thing as good food, it's the food you're used to, we want a consistent product, and he said, the, the thing he also noticed about McDonald's, was that when you're driving across the country, all mammals have to urinate about four to six times a day. And he says, you know, dad has to urinate, the kids got to urinate, but mom is up there in that front seat and she needs to urinate. And mom potties differently than dad. Dad will say, the Ray Kroc said, dad will go out, he'll pee on the side of the road, he'll pee in a Folgers can, he'll write his name in the snow, he'll pee off a cliff, he'll do anything. Mama has to sit down. And she instantly realized that when you pulled into that strange town, you knew that that filling station had a bathroom that looks like a camel just used it. You know the diner probably doesn't have any toilet paper. You gotta not only sit down, you gotta change the baby's diaper. And Ray Kroc said, we will send a cleaning crew in the woman's bathroom every hour on the bathroom and we will, all women will know, McDonald's has a standard clean bathroom with toilet paper. You can wash your hands, you can change a baby's diaper. It's the understanding the human side of free enterprise that makes you build strong relationships with your spouse, your children, your in-laws, your family, your friends, your employees, and most importantly, this will all build up and translate to your patients. In fact, the same dentists that I see that have problems with relationship with group practice or associate dentists, well, they come up to you and say, well, I tried a group practice and it was a disaster and we split up, we broke apart, and then I tried again, we split up. I can't believe you're up here saying group practice. And I, first thing out of my mouth, I say, really? Um, how, how many um, women have you been married to? And he looks at me kind of funny, like, uh, what do you mean? I said, well, you're on your first wife, second wife, third wife? Uh, I'm on my third wife. See, there you go, buddy. The same skills you need to have a relationship with your wife, which you don't have. You're on your third marriage and you're on your third associate and you think it's the associate? When are you going to look in the mirror and say, look, I don't listen, I don't care about other people's feelings, I don't, uh, I don't uh, understand other people's feelings, I don't try to create stronger relationships. If you fail at relationships with your wife, if you fail relationship with your son, your daughter, your in-laws, you probably are going to fail it with your associates, your hygienists, your receptionists, your assistants, and you're sure as hell that's going to translate to your practice. Relationships are relationships just because you make profit off of some and others you lose money on uh, doesn't matter. Um, Relations or relationships, you got to understand how these work. Now, let's take a closer look at some of these numbers here. Um, we know that um, when, when we're studying inside of practice, if you're running behind on some money, if you're, you're trying to put a kid through school or, you know, you got a divorce, your practice burned down, a hurricane hit your house, remember, the easiest way to make more money is just to work more hours. I mean, you know, my dad worked from 7 a.m. to 12 midnight, seven days a week for 15 years and he missed zero days of work. The guy was an animal. He'd go to work with a 100 degree fever and he'd say, you know, it's just easy to 
puke out your window or puke in the bathroom of your own restaurant than it is to stay home and puke in your own bathroom. If you're going to puke, you're going to puke. If you're going to be sick, you might as well be sick at work and making money on the deal. I don't know what the Centers of Disease Control would say about this philosophy, but uh, it's a very profitable one. But remember, if you get behind, quit, quit taking off three-day weekends. Every practice manager I lecture, they always say, have you ever noticed that the less hours that ends work, the more money they make? Well, that's your gut feeling, buddy. That's not what the ADA survey dental practice says. You can call them up at 1-800-621-8099, buy the report yourself. But they know, I know, everyone knows, MT and Maji knows, all the consultants knows, Jennifer knows, Linda Miles knows, Kathy Jameson knows, Sally McKenzie knows, that dentists who work over 40 hours a week average 140 plus a year. Dentists who only work about 32 hours a week only average about 105. And dentists who only work 32 hours a week or less are only about 85. 40% of dentists work 40 hours a week or more. 44% of dentists only work 32 hours a week. That's not even considered a full-time job. And 14% work less than 32 hours a week. We know that the average family practice general dentist works 48 weeks a year, specialists work 47 weeks a year. So the average dentist takes off a month a year on a 52 week year. Um, hours per week treating patients, the average dentist about 33 hours a week, average specialist 32 hours a week. Um, hours a year treating patients, about 1,600 hours a year for a family practice general dentist, uh, 1,550 for a specialist. Hours per week in the office is equal among dentists and specialists at 37 hours a week. Hours per year in the office is the same for dentists and specialists at 1,750 hours. Um, the thing I want you to know also is about, you know, we talked about that Ray Kroc will open up at McDonald's and its first month, It'll do 87 to 82 to 87 percent of the best month it's ever going to do in the history of this gosh darn restaurant. Same thing for pizza, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They don't open up a KFC and spend 10 years to build it up. And look, look at dentist incomes. Um, five to nine years out of school, you're at about 145,000 year average. Uh, 10 to 14 years. No, we're talking about specialists here. Specialists, five to nine years out, they're doing 145 a year. Uh, 10 to 14 years out, they're up to 180. 15 to 19 years out, they're up to 225. So it takes them from five years out to 19 years out. It takes them 19 years to peak at 225. And then they start the downward slide at 24 years out, they're down to 210. 29 years out, they're down to 190. 34 years out, they're down to 180. 40 years out, they're down to 145. And this is because they didn't get an exit strategy. By age 50, if you haven't called AFCO, or some brokerage firm to get a practice for a file so these people can analyze your practice. So in the case of death, just like life insurance policy, they could come get maximum value out of your office or they could start telling you, you know, here's how you get an associate, here's where associate can work under you on this contract for five, 10 years. And then at um, 10 years out, maybe you're 60, um, title ship transfers to this uh, associate dentist. And then you work under the exact same contract he worked under for 10 years as you uh, fade out. Uh, same contract for uh, your associate is the one you use, what's good for the goose, good for the gander. Um, family practice general dentist net income by five-year age group um, is, um, you know, the dentist doing uh, 30 to 34 years old, grosses 290, takes home 105. By 35 to 39, he grosses 345, takes home 100 and quarter. From 40 to 44, he grosses 355, takes home 130. And once again, he also or she also doesn't peak until 45 to 49, he gets it up to uh, 370, and that's 135. And then it's not until 50 to 54 do they actually hit the top of the peak at 380 and take home a buck 40, 140,000 a year. Then they start the backward slide. 55 to 59, they're down to grossing 295, taking home 115. And from 60 to 64, they're grossing 225, they're down to 110, which is about what they started at at age 30, which was 105. So what do we see here? We see that it takes from age 30 to 54 for the average aggregate dentist to go from 105 net to 140 net. So once again, it took these guys 24 years to peak when McDonald's does it the first 30 days. Rick Kirshner does it in his uh, Comfort Dentals. He's opened up 20 some offices and all of his offices hit a uh, pretty much a peak in uh, the second or third month. Um, family practice, general dentist statistics, uh, breaking it down. 330 is the average gross revenue uh, per dentist, which is about 1,600 hours per year. Their overhead's about 208,000, and you gotta divide that by number of days work to get your uh, break-even point for the day. Uh, the average dentist nets 122,000 net income before taxes. 
that's with 1600 hours per year chair side so that comes down to their their gross in about 205 dollars per hour per uh, for their office which is about 40 dollars an hour uh, per overhead per dental operatory chair treatment room which comes down to making about $80 an hour profit for the dental office, which breaks down to about $20 per hour profit per dental chair. Now for a specialist, it's, it's more. Remember these guys net about $70,000 a year or more. Their gross, um, family practice dentist was three thirty. dollars Theirs is four eighty. dollars uh, That's $280,000 a year overhead. They net $192,000. That's $70,000 more than you. And remember, these guys are usually in the same building as you. It's simply because they appropriately are priced out correctly. And if you price it like them, that single variable of just calling the endodontist next door, doing the same root canal you are, what do you charge for a one canal, two canal, three canal, four canal, and a retreat? That's your fee. Call the oral surgeon. What do you charge for a first tooth extraction, additional tooth, uh, wisdom tooth, partial tissue, partial bony, full bony? Um, call up your pedodontist. What do you charge for a chrome steel crown or a pulponomy? Call up your uh, prosthodontist. What do you charge for a crown, a denture, a partial? And you know what? The, the only procedure you make the most money on is a gosh darn crown, and that's about the only procedure you actually do charge what the prosthodontist charges. Um, dental specialists are, are doing about $185 an hour overhead per their office. That's $140 um, overhead uh, per chair, $125 per hour profit, which breaks down to $25 per hour profit per chair. Fact, over 60% of treatment plans are not executed. This is the type of data you need to know. Before you go into continuing education, you gotta know what you know, you gotta know what you don't know. First, take your continuing education internal. Before you go out to all the root canal, crown and bridges, cosmetic courses, bring in the consultants, bring in the practice management people, form a study club. But get to the bottom of your own practice so you need to know where you need to go. Um, I always thought that was very funny on um, treatment plans not executed. I'll, I'll take a dentist revenue. I'll be a general dentist and he did $330,000 of dentistry last year. And I look at that and that $330,000, like $12 of it was TMJ. So then I'll look at his continuing education plan. He's booked out two weeks for a TMJ course. I'll say, wow, that's, that's amazing. You think if Ray Kroc had 40% of his revenue was hamburgers, and none of it was from lasagna? Do you think he'd take his two weeks vacation and go study lasagna in Italy? Or do you think he'd focus on his gosh darn uh, bread and butter hamburger, french fries, Coca-Cola? So the deal is find out what you're selling first and then do the tree implants. If you want to take continuing education something else, find out what you're referring. We talked about Softin, has that practice referral report, how much you're referring out, how many are come back, how many of them tree implants that you referred out were accepted. You know, it's got all the data in the world. Well, if you're referring out, a $4,000 ortho case every week, that's $16,000 a month, and you did $12 a TMJ, why don't you go to Brock Rondeau or uh, Richard Litt or um, Garrity or Truett or Witzig or somebody and sit there and say, well, maybe uh, before, you know, I, uh, you look back at last year's data, $330,000, and you did maybe $1,000 worth of veneers, and now you're going to go to an institute that only teach you how to do veneers, but you only did $1,000 of the veneers last year, and you referred out $16,000 a month of orthodontics. You know, you need to know first the diagnosis, um, what treatment plans are, are not executed, which ones are being done, which ones are being done by other people than you. Um, go where you're already having success. You know, success leaves clues. Follow your own success. Quit trying to be other people. Um, Quit trying to be in other markets. You know, you're in Bumblebutt, Kansas, population 10,000, and you go act like that, uh, and you try to be like the people in Beverly Hills or Key Biscayne, Florida, or Manhattan, or Las Vegas, or San Francisco. And you know what? In Iowa, if you ask a typical mom in Iowa, hey, do you want to have $10,000 worth of veneers and a boob job? She goes, no, I'm, uh, I make lunches every morning. I'm trying to put peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and two lunch pills. I have two kids with crooked, ugly teeth. And who do you think on an animal behavior letter level that mom's going to fix up first? Her upper 10 veneers for $5,000 and a $5,000 boob job or braces for her two children? Moms and dads are self-sacrificing for their offspring. It's an internal biological drive that you are self-sacrificing into for your children. If you had a daughter... And she was blind. And the doctor said, we could take out mom's eyes and put the eyes in the child and the child would see. Would mom do it or would she say, hell no? 
What would mom actually say? Oh, no, she wouldn't say do it. She'd say, hell, take my husband's eyes. He don't need his eyes. He's just a paycheck and parts. Then, in fact, take his damn liver, his brain, whatever the hell you need. And uh, But after Friday, after he gets paid. And, uh, you know, these people are going to always buy for their children first. And take this back home. You got out of dental school. You had $86,000 of student loans. I know I did. Um, you have that first couple of Christmas with the kids. Did you ever have a Christmas where you and the wife didn't exchange because you were trying to get Billy a bicycle or somebody else's skateboard or, or maybe had a college son that really wanted to go on a ski trip or whatever, and mom and dad said, uh, no, let's not exchange, or dad said, let's exchange, here's what I want, he whispers in her ear, and then she gets punched a few times. And um, dental graduates, dental graduates, the average dental graduate has $56,000 in tuition school-related debt. The average dental school graduate debt has $26,000 in visa and discretionary debt. So the average dental school graduate has a total debt of $82,105. You know, if you go back to 1970 and you take the dental graduates, it took 18 months for the 50th percentile dentist to get in their own practice. That was the 1970 graduating class. 18 months for the 50th percentile to be in their own practice. Go to the 1990 graduating class, Six and a half years, okay? And a lot of it is because in 1970, if you had a, if you had a dental degree, a medical degree, or a law degree, any bank in town would give you a loan. Today, the only way a dental graduate can get a loan from a bank with $82,000 in debt is if he walks into the bank with a ski mask and a revolver, okay? And even then, it's a limited loan. Uh, general dentist versus specialist, and we, you know, we talk about this, that you know, general dentist average 330 production, specialists are 480. Um, gross production per month, um, general dentists are 27500 a month, specialists are 40000 a month. Net income per year, general dentists 122000 a year, specialists 192000 a year. Net income per month, general dentists average 10166 a month, specialists are 16000 a month. Overhead percentage, 60% for the average general dentist. 53% for a specialist. So I can tell you right there, you want to drop your overhead from 60 to 53% and take your net from 122 to 192? Don't call somebody in Beverly Hills or Manhattan or Key Biscayne or Las Vegas or San Diego or San Francisco and ask them what they charge for a procedure. Draw a five mile radius around your office and ask the specialist in your own backyard, you know the ones, the ones that are gonna grade your work and if it ever goes to your local state board where they say, I don't care how they do ortho and root canals. And I know Angelo Sargeni is dead. Um, you're telling me about how great Sargeni is and he's from Europe. Well, you're in Texas, buddy. Angelo Sargeni is dead. You're not in Europe. You did a root canal, we just brought in the endodontist from your county, and he said this is garbage and you're going down. This paraformaldehyde went out the end, it, it uh, pickled the nerve, this lady has a numb lip, and the tooth had to be extracted, um, write this lady a check for $50,000. So there you are, only making 122 with 60% overhead, because you're doing work that's gonna be graded by the guy next door to you in the same building who's earning 192 with 53% overhead. It's called market segmentation. If you're gonna go up against a Buick, I don't care what company you're in, you better charge what a Buick does, otherwise you're not gonna have the money to sit there and build the car that'll go up against the Buick. You can't sit there and say, well, they're selling a Ford Taurus for $20,000, and I'm gonna go against it, but I'm gonna sell it, I'm only gonna ask $10,000 for it. Well, if these guys get $20,000 for the price, Subtract the profit of 20%, so now they got a $16,000 budget to build a car. You got $10,000, you take away 20 cents of profit. You've only got uh, $8,000 to budget for a car. How can your $8,000 make a car to compete with this $16,000 car? Well, that's how the legal system works. There's only one market stratification in healthcare, and it's called your local state board, and they only have one standard of care for the whole county, even though every other market from food to clothes to restaurants to entertainment to hotels. I mean, tell me this. I can stay in a Hotel 6 for $40. Do you think the Motel 6 has everything I can get at the Holiday Inn or Ramada for 80 bucks? Do you think when I go to the Westin and pay $3.95 for a night, do you think the Westin and the Motel 6 have everything in common? I mean, think about it. Where in the world, what other segment of society is there a string, single market stratification? But I'm telling you, General Dennis, don't do lower quality dentistry for less money on patients because you think they're going to appreciate it because, sure, 
999 out of a thousand will appreciate and say thank you doctor but when the one out of a thousand mr butthole takes you to the state board they're going to compare you to the specialist the state boards the government the insurance companies they don't understand market segmentation so until the government gets their act together the state board gets their act together i'm charging what the specialists do and i'm either going to do it at their level of quality and i'm going to get their fee for it or i'm not going to do it and i'm going to refer it out Ill, if you're illiterate, please write for help at Howard Ferran, 10850 South 48th Street, Phoenix, Arizona, 85044. That means if you don't get it, you don't get it, just do it. Decision comes from Latin, decisive, to cut off. Make a decision. In fact, on this fee deal, it's so stressful for general dentists to raise their fees because they take everything so personal that what I really ask, if the whole office is listening to this, let the office manager take this over. At today's dental, the dentist don't even have anything to do with raising fees. The office manager does this. She does a fee survey every 90 days. We adjust her fees every 90 days. It's not even a function for the dentist. And staff, let me tell you something. If your dentist doesn't make any profit, it's not going to be any fun to work there. If your dentist doesn't make any profit, you've got a lockbox over the thermostat. He asks everyone to bring their own toilet paper to work. Or he stands at the door every morning, gives each person four little squares. And you sit there and say, well, can we get an intro camera? Can we get a laser? Can we get micro abrasion? Can we get a light system? Can we have Sally McKenzie come out to our office? Can we get one 800 dentists? Um, can we go to the Richards Report? Can we go to the Profit Dentist in Destin? And all he says is no, 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 no. And he's not saying that because he's a jerk. He's saying that because he looks at the cash register. He looks at the gosh darn banking statements. He looks at his statement of cash flow, his check register, and he doesn't have any money. You can't suck blood out of a turnip. If you get the fees to where they need to be, there'll be profit. When there's profit, you'll notice that the dentist will stop taking the nitrous tank home with him at night. You'll notice he'll start smiling. He'll quit changing out wise every three to five years. And it'll be a very functional, healthy, happy place to work out. This also... Um, you know, old D. Pinky said that, you know, 2% are masters, 54% are indifferent. We know that happiness, um, one of the smartest genius psychologists that ever lived was um, Hinman Roshark. Remember the Roshark ink blots? Remember the ink blot test? Um, and Hinman, these guys knew there were thoughts in your unconscious head that you weren't aware of. It was your unconscious. Sigmund Freud called your id. Then your, you had your ego and your superego. And he noticed that he was trying to get out thoughts and what he would do is this guy was a genius he would face you to a wall and he would sit behind you in a chair remember all psychoanalytical started with the couch where they would get behind you and what herman rochark would do is he would put like an ink blot up on a wall and, and just be like a spot ink and he'd say tell me um what do you see in that and the man said it's a chicken getting squashed with a sledgehammer He's like, wow, you know, is that a functional, healthy, healthy, happy thought? Or is that a dysfunctional, negative, stressful thought? And then you say, well, tell me, what, is, what does this ink blot look like? It's a cat being ran over by a car. Wow. And, you know, he'd write down, this guy's sick. Now, then the next patient would come in, he'd put the same exact ink blot on the wall. And say, what is that? And she'd say, it's two butterflies kissing. <laughs> well, that's a happy thought. And, and he learned, after years and years of doing this, Sigmund Freud did a little differently. He'd get these, um, he, the reason Freud's literature was so twisted because the patient pool he worked on, he was only working with about a hundred um, paranoid schizophrenic women and he was getting them looped up on cocaine and nitrous oxide and that's why he was uh, obsessively compulsive with sex. If he would have had a more aggregate um, sampling of, the, uh, of people, for a patient base, he probably wouldn't have gone so much off the deep end of sex, but both of them were for everlasting psychoanalysis geniuses because they were identifying that there are thoughts that you're unconscious, you might not be aware of. Later, this was taken off by Abraham Maslow, who took it a step further, um, and he noticed that he would sit behind you and he would ask word associations and he would say things, well, well tell me about your job or tell me about your life, tell me about your hobbies, and he noticed that with the, remember we keep talking about it's the words that you choose to use that frame the debate you know when we're talking about debate what stifles creativity well a lot of it's framing the words that you use with the definitions that you attach to these words are how you frame the debate well if he would it, he would notice that if you would talk about your work and your life as totally separate unities 
you were at the bottom level. You were mostly unhappy, burned out, depressed. You're like, well, at five o'clock when I get off work, I go home and I'm, I'm not going to put my number on my business card and I'm unlisted and God dang it, at five o'clock I've had enough. I'm going home. I'm not dealing with work anymore. He noticed these people are most likely to be unhappy, burned out, and depressed. Now, do you think Mother Teresa, if some dying Indian in Calcutta walked up to her at five o'clock, she'd say, no, look, if you're going to die in my arms, you need to be here before five o'clock. You're not going to die in my arms at 530. I'm going to Hooters to have a beer and I'll just have to, you'll just have to die in my arms tomorrow. See, you think Michael Jordan sits there and says, I am not bouncing a basketball on Sunday. I bounce the ball all day, Monday through Friday, eight to five. I'm not playing basketball. Do you think Tiger Woods sits there and says, well, this sucks. The tournament's on the weekend. I have to golf on the damn weekend. This really sucks. These people don't think about this. When these people talk about their work and their life, they're up on top. Michael Jordan, Mother Teresa, Tiger Woods, when you sit them in a chair, face them to the wall, ask them all these leading questions about their life and work, you will find out that they do not differentiate the two. The people that sometimes do and don't, they have good days and bad days. But the secret to happiness, fulfillment, and success is when you get your life and work and destiny into one unit yourself. So like Gordon Christian, I mean, it, it's, it's your work is your identity. Well, this is the same thing about um, Abraham Maz, uh, L.D. Pinky said, 2% are masters. That's the people who life and work and dentistry. L look at Dawson. How many years has Dawson been saying he's retired now? Every time he tells me he's retired, the next thing I find out, he's going to go lecture five more cities and have more weekend courses. Peter Dawson will retire from dentistry three minutes after he dies. Okay, same with Gordon Christian, G.V. Black, all these people. Um, L.D. Pinky nailed it. 2% are masters, 8% are adept, 36% are students. Those are all the ones above the line. But below the line, the 54% are indifferent. Those are the ones that totally separate their dental occupation from their life. Are you below the line where dentistry is an occupation? Or are you above the top line where dentistry is your vocation? I've never heard a priest tell me, well, uh, uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and Sundays at 8, 10, and 12, uh, my occupation is a priest. But after that, man, it's hooters, it's beers, it's teddy bars, and uh, I'm just, you know, I'm in a whole different life. It's a vocation, not an occupation. Same thing with your marriage. Abraham Maslow could predict within five years, he could predict out five years of man so you'd be married or divorced. He would sit there, he'd face you in a chair, he'd face you to a wall, and he'd say, tell me about your wife. And if he'd say, well, she's got her friends and I got my friends. She has her checking account. I have my checking account, her parents, and she went there for Christmas and I'm here. And if every time you talked about you and your spouse, it was different, you were below the line, you were unhappy, burned out, depressed. And if you shared some things in common, usually only a kid that linked these two guys together. You had your check account, her check account, his job, your job, everything separate, the kid in the middle. They had good days and bad days. Sometimes they float apart. But he said the happiest, most fulfilled and successful marriages, no matter what hell the question Abraham Maslow would ask you about your wife, you'd always answer the things things like, well, we like to go bowling. We like to go dancing. We have a checking account. We work together in the family business. We do this. We do that. And he would say it got to where they were such an identity that if one was sick and dying, the other one was suffering too. If one was happy, the other one was happy for him. There was no, well, you think you're hot, you're happy. Well, I'm, I'm resentful. Blah, 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 blah. They were one unit. He said, how would would these people ever get a divorce they don't even have a separate identity he said the only people that get divorced are people who have separate identities and go separate ways they might be artificially linked for five or ten years with a kid or something weird but eventually they drift apart they never wore one unit go from an occupation to a vocation go from your friends and her friends to you go here and she goes there well she likes to go bowling and I like to go to the Phoenix Suns basketball games start finding something you have in common go to one unit one entity one vocation, one spouse, one marriage. Why? Not for ethical, religious, moral reasons. Do it so you'll be happy, fulfilled, and successful. Greg Stanley I talked about it. If you haven't heard Greg Stanley at least three or four times before you're 50 years old, you've already lost about a million dollars of cash on the table. And the one thing Greg Stanley said is that I'm back to financial planning. He's got financial data on about 14,000 dentists. Number one determinant variable on when you'll retire, and uh, when you won't retire, number of times you've been divorced. If you've never been divorced, you'll probably retire at about 54 with a lot of money, no debt. 
Divorce twice, you'll probably work till 65. Divorce three times, you will die in a dental office, okay? Think about that next time you're thinking about humping the help, okay? Don't hump the help. Keep married, one unit, save your money. You can't grow rich if you divide your assets every seven to 10 years. Fact, average required continued education units is 18 hours a year, 53 hours over a three year period. On average, dentists attend three seminars or conferences per year. Going back to the most successful dentist, the most successful dentist who made the most money the fastest averaged about 350 hours of continuing at a year. I mean, and, and, and they don't even know they did 350 hours. Like you, like you, I remember having breakfast one time with Peter Dawson at the, uh, uh, somewhere in Phoenix here with the Camelback, um, um, some, some um, place down here when he was doing his top 10% deal. And I was asking him, I say, well, how did you get involved in it? How did you get so good in TMJ and anatomy and all this? And he's talking about when he was out of dental school and he used to meet with these three other dentists and they used to do dissections and this and that and all these joints. I mean, do you think Peter Dawson said, well, it's Saturday and I'm going to get up and I'm going to do eight hours of continuing education when I go find some cutoff head and do a dissection with three of my buddies? I mean, this guy didn't even know what he was doing continuing. In fact, the more I listen to Dawson, I figure Peter Dawson and Gordon Christian probably did 1,500 hours of continuing education a year without even knowing it. I mean, you can't all the times they read, journals, most of the stuff was self-directed. Joe Blaze has done more success with dental economics. In fact, when I started the Ferrani Report, if I knew Joe Blaze was going to take over dental economics the following year, uh, I might not have even started. I mean, the guy was fantastic. I mean, why? Because dental economics used to have a journalist running their thing. Um, hell, I'd submit articles after articles, and they'd, uh, they'd tell me. He was lecturing 50 to 60 times a year, had a successful practice, and every article I'd send these guys, he'd say, well, I don't think this really applies to dentistry. I'm like, you're not even a dentist. Hell, you don't even have a dental. How the hell would you know? Well, dental economics, they just put in Joe Blaze, a dentist, and now he runs a call in Pearls for Practice. If you haven't heard Joe Blaze lecture, do it. I always like to show this lecture. I had Joe Blaze come in and do consulting in my office before he was even a, um, a star in dental economics and on the lecture scene. Um, Sally McKenzie um, um, used to do a lot with them. I remember the first time I ever lectured in St. Louis, Joe Blaze uh, was so into dentistry, he picked me up at the airport. Him and another friend took me to this place that uh, served... Um, Oh, uh, what is it? Um, barbecued beef chicken sandwiches with a pickle and french fries in a basket. Um, I show this picture. Um, that's actually, uh, you think that's me. I just throw that picture in there. Uh, that's a bald head. looks like me, but that's actually not me. There's some other ugly fella out there somewhere. And uh, he used to come out of my practice, give me all these little tips and pearls about what to do. And I have high self-esteem enough. I don't care if these people come in and see everything that's wrong with my practice. I go ask Joe Blaze, say, well, you were in Howard Friends' office. Was it perfect, flawless? Does he walk on water? He'd, he'd start laughing. He'd say, hell no. But he tries hard. They did 2.4 million years. I think he helped me out a lot. I think Sally McKenzie helped me out a lot. I think a ton of people helped me out a lot. Um, here's the first cosmetic procedure uh, Joe Blaze did when he went to my office. He uh, put a bunch of acid etch on my head, and then he painted this, and he rinsed it off real thoroughly, and... Uh, then he painted this bonding solution on my head, something from Denmat, and then he, um, he stuck this little follicle stuff, and then he uh, turned this light on, and within an hour, Joe Blaze in my office, my God, he had me completely turned around, and uh, if it wasn't for that, I mean, Joe Blaze uh, actually was the one responsible for all the hair on my head, and um, when your mom saw your lazy, bored, and stressed, she said, go do something, get off the couch, and go play. This change of physical state changes your overall state. You know, when you're in your dental office, you're the only dentist. We're, we're a socially dependent creature in an interdependent society, and, but you're in there as a solo practice. That's why physicians, I think, on the aggregate have the healthier state of mind because in the big cities where 55% of Americans live, they're mostly in group practice. The holes bear in the sum, everybody feeds on each other. In dentistry, too many dentists are dysfunctional because they're solo practicing dentists. Um, you know, they got staff in there, but the, the assistant and the hygienist and the receptionist is it near the stimulation as someone as a professional sovereign colleague dentist who can get on you one-in-one -on -one and group practice so good. When someone's having a bad day or they're frustrated or they come out in the hall and they're just like, you know, you just look at them and they're just frustrated. What's wrong? Oh, I don't know. I've been in there for 30 minutes and I can't get out this root tip. Hey, 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 go take a break. Let me go in there, pop it out in two seconds, high five each other, get each other pumped up, or I'll come in there and, and I'll sit there and say, it's the third time I've adjusted this lady's denture, 
and uh, gosh darn, she's driving me crazy. And uh, I remember we just had one last week where I've been working on this thing, I was blue in the face. And uh, Dr. Taylor walked in there in two seconds, fresh eyes, fresh state of mind, bit down, leaned her back, did that little Dawson bilateral mandibular manipulation and said, Howard, you missed the bite. And, uh, you know, and I had checked the bite five times, but you get tunnel vision. Doctors and group practice feed off each other, and that's what continuing education does more than anything. It gets you to go to super alpha bull male studs like Carl Miss, Dick Barnes, Erwin Becker at the Pink Institute, Bert Lottie, Joe Blaze, Bill Blatchford, Steve Buchanan, Craig Callen, Gordon Christian, Rella, Peter Dawson, Jennifer D. St. George, Bill Dickerson, Hugh Dougherty, Bill Dorfman, Ralph Duffin, um, Deborah Inglehart, Ross Nash, Earl Eastep, Ronald Feynman, Ron Goldstein, Walter Haley, Beth Hammock, Fred Joyle, Rennie Schellner of Lord's Dental Studio, uh, Charles English, uh, Bill Strupp, Ted Fetner, Pete Frechette, Bob Ganley, Williams Ivy Claire, Paul Holomy, uh, Ronald Jackson, Ken James. I mean, there's so many you couldn't count them. But when you get with these people, their energy level. I mean, just if you stay in the same room with Kathy and John Jameson, you're going to bounce off the wall, Sally McKenzie, Rolly Jones, go to gosh darn Arkansas, tour the Prodentech plant. Um, meet Jeffrey Tomer, a malpractice lawyer, Gary Takas, Greg Tarantola at the Pink Institute, John Coy, Rick Kirshner, Kim Cooch of Creative, um, on and on. Mac Lee, Roger Levine, Richard Lipp, Brock Rondeau, Rich Maddow, Woody Oaks, Mike Malone, um, Mike, um, Michael Maroon of the Dental Leader, uh, Travis McPhee, Mike Miller, Bob Nixon, Tom Orant. Um, go, go visit Henry Shine. Go meet Stan Bergman, CEO, Linda Miles, Joe Stevens, Mark Troilo, Kisco Seminar, Stu Rosenberg, N.T. Ismanji, Carl Misch is a must, John Kanka, Anthony Gallagos, Tom Trigner, Bill Rossi at Minneapolis, St. Paul, Dave Runkle out there in Columbus, uh, Mike Schuster out here in Scottsdale, George Tykowski of Williams Ivoclair, Patrick Wall is a great endonist, great endonist are Cliff Brettel, Ben Johnson, G. John Schofel, John McSpadden, Kit Weathers. Go to gosh darn Salt Lake City and visit the alternate plant. Go through Dan Fisher. Go up and meet Jim Pride. Come to Phoenix and, and one trip meet Jim and Naomi Road, me, Omar Reed, Gary Takis, Greg Stanley. Go out to Santa Maria, California and tour the gosh darn Denmap plant. You'll learn more about bonding there in one hour than you will in three hours or three days to continue ed. Larry Rosenthal, every time I go to New York, I go through Larry's place. When you go to these people, their energy is contagious. This changes your physical state. Dentists that are burned out and they, they don't see the end of the rope and they think dentistry sucks and they want to get out of it. Then they meet an exact same educated dentist, maybe even from their same dental school, their same age, and their life is massively different. Why? Because it's their aptitude was determined by their attitude. And you can sit there and see in real life what would happen if you made some major decisions, made some major changes, and built an office like all of these people have. And you're like, God, I never realized the stakes are so high. I'm in this deadbeat office, a thousand square foot, paneling, shag carpeting, no intro camera, no micro abrasion, no Syriac 2. I don't know how to do bonding. I can't do anything. I can't place an implant. I hate pulling wisdom teeth. It's hard. Everything's hard. Everything sucks. My patients are mad. My staff are deadbeat. My wife ran off and left me for a truck driver. Uh, I mean, my gosh. And then you walk into these people and you say, wow, I never realized how great it would really be if I would make some decisive, clean-cut actions, I recommend when you, until you reach all your dental goals, don't go for this, gosh darn, 18 hours of continuing education a year. Go take 350 a year till you reach your destiny. Dentists say, I just can't motivate my staff. Try saying this all pumped up with emotion, saying, I know I can motivate my staff. I mean, it's all your energy level. Success is the result of good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from making decisions both good and bad. Remember the average millionaire goes bankrupt six times? He keeps making decisions, eventually he's a millionaire. Your paralysis by analysis, in fact, I had a dentist the other day say, well, you know, I went to this, that MTS Manji course and he wanted me to sign up for that orthodontic deal and he said that you have to be a pretty good salesman to sell veneers, but he said that I had no personality. In fact, he said, I didn't have enough personality to be an accountant. And um, he said, maybe I should go into ortho because mom's already bought ortho. She can look at her child and diagnose that since Billy looks like he can eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence, 
he probably needs ortho and but you know but i looked at the price of the course and to see richard lit or brock rundo is going to cost four thousand dollars and i just think that's a lot of money i'm like numb nuts numb nuts come here what is your first orthodontic case going to sell for what's ortho go for uh four thousand a case so you're telling me you're going to learn how to do orthodontics you're not going to do one case you really believe it i mean if you believe that hang yourself in the basement tonight I mean, just do it. Get out of your misery. I mean, come on. Make an intelligent decision. And okay, so you learned how to do a posterior composite and you did your first one and the tooth ended up getting root canal the week later. Anybody who tells you they didn't do that um, during dental school or the first year or two out is a liar, okay? Um, we all make mistakes, but it's a tooth you did a, a posterior composite on that ended up getting root canal or didn't uh, pack food or was sensitive or um, went somewhere else and won your money back. That's what made you stand alert and say, hey, I think I better go back to that course again. And you're back there. I remember I saw Bird Lottie for his two-day seminar every year I think for about 10 years in a row. And I mean, I kept going back and I remember one time Raymond said to me at lunch, he said, you know what, Howard? He said, well, you know the weirdest thing about you? You're asking the exact same questions you asked last year. I remember these questions verbatim. What is it you don't understand? I said, Raymond, there must be something I don't understand. But it's going back. It's going back. It's standing in the face of adversity in a 100 mile an hour headwind until you get this thing turned around and it becomes a 100 mile an hour tailwind. Um, so just stick with it. I told you about General George Patton. I have studied the enemy all my life. I have read the memoirs of his generals and his leaders. I have even read his philosophers and listened to his music. I have studied in detail the account of every damned one of his battles. I know exactly how he will react under any given set of circumstances, and he hasn't the slightest idea when I'm going to whip the hell out of him. You find a mentor. It's called benchmarking. If you're Honda and Toyota does something great, you just study Honda. Honda, Toyota, Mercedes-Benz, Lexus, Ford, you name it. All they do is they sit around, they study the daylights out of each other, and each other has no idea when someone's going to come out with a minivan or a four-wheel drive or, or uh, on and on. Who would have guessed five years ago that GM would be coming out with these gosh darn $35,000 trucks that get eight miles to the gallon and uh, everybody would want to buy one? You know, when everybody else would thought everything was going towards four-cylinder uh, good gas mileage. My professor at um, Arizona State University, my favorite, one of my favorite professors was Professor Manus Rungtus Anatom. Say that five times in a row real fast. Um, I don't even know where he's from. Somewhere in Thailand, I think it was. Uh, in operations logistic management, he used to say, everyone has the ability to learn. It is simply a matter of how. Some people learn from routine practicing. Some people learn from reading, memorizing, and understanding. Some people learn from observing and or concentrated study. Still others learn from applications to real world phenomena. Everyone has the ability to learn. It is simply a matter of degree, a matter of how much and how fast. Some people can absorb vast amounts of knowledge in a short period of time. Still others learn in tiny leaps and bounds. Everyone has the ability to learn. There is neither a right way nor a wrong way. As a provider of job, as a provider of knowledge, my job of, is to help my students learn in a manner satisfactory to their ability to learn. And I think I was probably the most difficult student in this class because poor professor, you know, he's a gentleman, a scholar. The guy's a PhD mathematician, certified brilliant genius. No matter what the hell he was trying to explain in shipbuilding or factories or whatever, I was always raising my hand. So how does this apply to a dental office? He needs to come up to me and say, Howard, the whole world is not a dental office. There are other things. There's manufacturing. They make products. You drop it on your foot. You say, ow, that hurts. Have you ever dropped a root canal on your foot? Is your whole damn world a dental office? And I'd say, yeah, I think so. And Walt Disney used to say, in this volatile business of ours, we can ill afford to rest on our laurels, even to pause in retrospect. Times and conditions change so rapidly that we must keep our aim constantly on the future. Um, Managing at the Speed of Change was a great book by Daryl Connor. And he, he wrote this book in 1992. said, remember when American made meant quality and made in Japan meant cheap? Remember when banks were secure and risk averse, hospitals were safe and affordable, sexually transmitted disease were cured with a shot of penicillin, and marijuana was our primary drug concern, and computers were big and expensive? That was in 92. Now it's the year 2000. Every one of those statements is reversed and completely backwards. 
He also goes to write in his book, suppose you are an executive driving down the road with the corporate gas pedal floored, yet competitors are still passing you by. You're pushing your company towards change as hard as you can, but the car will not go more than 35 miles per hour. You bemoan the fact that your competitors are advancing with ease while you're running your vehicle into the ground just to keep up. Desperately, you look for answers. At the next gas station, you receive some good advice. At 25 miles per hour, shift into second gear. You've done all you can in first gear. Uh, Joan Height, good writer um, at the Arizona Republic locally, always writes, it is a well-known fact that demand creates a market. A market creates opportunity, and opportunities will never be ignored. Um, my favorite book, probably, that uh, Manus Rungtus Anatom ever turned me on to, that this book, by the way, an MBA school, this is the, probably the e-myth and the goal. It's probably the only book that no matter where I meet an MBA from, they've read this book. This is probably the most significant impact book on my practice. Not so much that it was written about things that were just so genius and understandable. I just had no idea how I got to be 35 years old and it never, under, never once this concept dawned on me. But Elia M. Elia M. Goldratt, and Israeli operations and logistics genius realized that operation logistics was always presented in advanced calculus, geometry, trigonometry, cosines, tangents, and he finally realized, you know what? The reason nobody does operation logistics is because everyone hates math. So you know what this genius did? This flippin' math genius takes the entire mathematical calculus world of operation logistics, reduced it to a 300-page love story, I kid you not, that did not have a single math equation in the entire book. And you, you read this little love story of 300 pages. It's so good you can't put it down. Um, your office staff loves it because, remember, girls buy 99% of love stories. The male equivalent is boys buy 99% of porn. And uh, it was absolutely awesome. And he says in this deal that the kiss of death to the naive Greek approach came at the end of the 18th century when Lavoisier showed that fire is not a substance, but rather a process, the process of attachment to oxygen. The Japanese were aware of three powers, the sword, the jewel, and the mirror. The sword symbolizes the power of weapons. The jewel symbolizes the power of money. The mirror symbolizes the power of self-knowledge. That's from Gung Ho, Ken Blanchard, and Sheldon Bowles. You have to have knowledge. Schools are designed to produce good employees, not employers. Most employers are either learned these success skills from their dad who owned his own business, or they have to be a reading junkie. In fact, you notice that in the... Um, some parts of America in the 50 large cities and the inner cities where most kids are growing up, where about 68% of kids grow up without a dad, they don't have any success skills. And they're, they've been welfare dependent for, you know, four generations, unless they're on an Indian reservation, then they've been welfare dependent for a couple hundred years. And you sit there and you have people wash up on the shore from Asia. And back in Asia, their dad owned their own restaurant or their own business or whatever. They come up on the shores of the Pacific and, and California and Oregon and Seattle. They don't understand English, or maybe they're in Vancouver, Canada. They don't understand English. They couldn't find Washington, D.C. on a map. And within three years, they own their own business. And, and by the second generation, they're living out in the suburbs, okay? They're self dependent. They're independent. They're not interdependent on some socialistic democratic party, um, Rod uh, Gore, Albert Gore, deluded communist uh, welfare, give everybody the wrong incentive. I mean, look what Al Gore stands for. If you're 18 years old and you get straight A's, you probably won't get a scholarship. But if you're uh, drop out of school at 16, get pregnant, knocked up, he wants you to have free housing, free food stamps, free welfare. It's like every time you have a dysfunctional behavior in America, they give you a war reward. Every time you do something right, they confiscate half your uh, payroll taxes and money. And why do they confiscate half your payroll taxes? So they can take your money away from being a bad person who was working and earning money so they can go give it all to dysfunctional people. Uh, all it does is in economics, you make decisions based on incentives. And all the Democratic Party has done for 40 or 50 years is give the wrong incentives to their people. In fact, all I want to do is go to the inner city and say, um, guys, um, do, do, do you like your situation here? No, it sucks. Okay, it sucks, right? You agree that this sucks. So first, just tell me one thing. Who is your leader? They go, well, that guy right there. That's the problem. Why are you still voting for the same leader who led you to suck them? Okay? Find out where the rich people are. Who's their leader? 
follow that guy. You're following the wrong leader. Monks for hire. Look what technology does. If you're sitting here, you know, we got a lot of dentists that adverse technology. I mean, anything that comes out. I remember when the intro all that camera came out in 1987. By 1990, barely a percent of the dentists had one. By the year 2000, it was barely 40%. By the year, it's the year 2000, and six out of every 10 dentists still can't figure out an intro camera for a human being who records all their memory visually, not through the ear. I mean, when you meet a new patient, are you like a dog? Does the first thing you do is smell their butt? Or do you maintain eye contact, okay? Do you give them a card to hold with their opposing thumb? Or do you put an electronic device in their ear and wire them up to the World Wide Web? Technology changes the whole game. It turns the game on its back. Um, look at the stealth attack of the 15th century style. The printing press replaced thousands of manuscript copying monks and scribes. And what this did, the printing press really kicked off the Industrial Revolution because at the year 1450, Monks did all the transcription. They could hardly copy anything. They were making less than a half million copies a year. And by 1490, in just 40 short years, Europe had gone from making a half million manuscripts a year to six million. That's a 12-fold increase. You know what that meant? It cheapened the cost of knowledge. So now you had knowledge flying around. That's what led uh, Martin Luther to start the Lutheran church and saying um, church in the people's English and um, spreading information about building ships and windmills and what have you. This is what kicked off technology. There's only three things that build the wealth of the nation. People, technology, and what they called capital stock, which is the technology that was already there and acquired when you were born. When you were born, they already had streets, roads, bridges, John Deere tractors, airplanes. They had been in the moon and back, won world wars. All that stuff that was accumulated in capital stock, plus the new technology, plus the labor market, determined those are the only three variables of economics. In fact, that's what got Robert Solow a Nobel Prize in economics in 1960. Scientific and mathematical certainty. Making a statement on the basis of an accumulation of empirical evidence gives a scientific certainty, even though not an eternal and perfect mathematical certainty. These are different and should be differentiated, according to Abraham Maslow on management. You should have easy one-stop shopping for all your dental needs. Get your FAGD, then your MAG. I ask, here, here's another uh, interesting thing in dentistry that really drives me crazy. Dentists will come to practice management. And I'll say, okay, write down why you're studying practice management or why you want to study practice management. And they say, well, I'm doing, you know, 25000 a month and I want to do 45000 a month. And um, I'm working five days a week and I want to work four and I want to make $40,000 of work and I want to do this type of dentistry and I want to do all this stuff. And then I go find a dentist who does all that. And I say, oh, God, um, Rod Gore here in Scottsdale, Steve Hayes. Um, gosh darn, um, you know, all these people I'll find around there. Uh, and I'll say, you know, everybody that comes to my courses defines your ideal practice, and it's not nearly as big as mine, and you have this ideal practice they all want to be. Why don't you write me a practice management article for the brand report? Oh, I don't do practice management. I just practice the way every dentist taking practice management course wants to be. Well, what's weird about that is they got their practice management success backwards. Instead of going to practice management and listening to non-dentists with Don Benloffs with Don Prototypes to try to get there with magnets on their refrigerators and ads in the yellow pages and basically getting their butt backwards, they did it the other way. You know, like a dentist will come in and say, well, you know, I want to get off these PPOs. And I'll say, well, or I want to get off HMOs. And I'll say, well, you know, 14.5% of dentists take HMOs and about 30 8% take PPOs. By the time you get your fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry, the HMOs drop down to done, and the PPOs drop down to under the radar screen. And by the time, you know, there's 12, there's 31,000 dentists in the Academy of General Dentistry, 12,000 of them had their fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry, and 1,100 went 600 more hours and got their mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. And by the time you get your MAGD, you're usually pulling home 60000 a month. You take no HMOs. You have no PPOs. You can do endodontic therapy and root canals to the level of, not not to the level of, but close to someone like a Cliff Ruddle, Ben Johnson, G. John Schofield, John McSpadden, Kit Weathers, or Patrick Wall. And they'll do pediatric dentistry on children. They can do ortho, not to the level of Brock and Doe or Richard Lebb, but pretty damn close. Um, they can do oral surgery. They can wisdom teeth removal. Yes, they've placed a half dozen implants. Yes, they can do periodontal therapy. Um, yes, they can do dentures and partials. And if there's a problem with the denture or partial, they can use other tools in their toolbox like implants and put some other support in there. 
there and by learning. And, and, and why, do they, why do they do all these things? Well, that's what's neat about the FAGD. It's structure. You know, if you leave a general dentist on their own and they go out in their lifetime, you know, a lot of dentists come up to me and say, well, I don't have my FAGD, but I've got the same number of hours. I know I've got over a thousand hours. And I'll say, well, uh, show me a list of it. I mean, I, I'm not asking for proof. I'm not saying you're a liar. Show me a list of it. Oh, I don't have a list. Well, I said, well, I know every speaker out there. Just, just tell me what you say. Have you taken this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy? And just no, 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 no. And I said, I know what you've done. See, you're doing a self-directed program. You've probably taken 1,000 hours in the last 10 years. And probably 500 of it was Crown and Bridge and 500 of it was with Fillings. And you keep trying to solve all your problems with the same two hammers. If you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But the FAGD breaks it down into 12 different categories. They said it's not good enough to just have 600 hours. You could have 38 hours in all these different categories. And I remember, my gosh, and then the FAGD was just 500 hours of lecture, an all-day exam, and five-year experience with dentists. dentist. And that wasn't too bad, but... I used to whine like, oh, I got to go take, I'll never forget, I was so mad. The only, to finish my FAGD, there was two areas I hadn't done. I had to go um, to do orthodontics, and then I had to um, go take some implant course. And I didn't want to do ortho or implants. And I'm sitting there, I went to Richard Litz office, and I remember I sat in the front row like this. And I'm only taking it because I had to. About the end of the first day, I'm like, wow, this is neat. By the time I got my requirements, the FAGD, I was already turned on to ortho and implants. Then something was went wrong even after that. Then being anal compulsive, I said, well, I want to get my MAGD. Well, now it's not only 600 more hours. FAGD is 500 hours, but MAGD is 600 hours. But it's more difficult than that because 400 hours has to be hands-on. Participation. Well, I'm in Arizona. There's no dental school. I spent $100,000 flying around taking these courses. And it was probably about a hundredfold return on my investment. And I sit there. And how was I going to find uh, 48 hours of participation in uh, gosh darn implants? So I had to sign up for the mission soon. I'm looking at this thing saying, who the hell's Carl Mission? Gosh darn, I got to go to Pittsburgh five times for a three-day weekend. And it's $2,500 a weekend, and I'm never placing an implant. I got oral surgeons that do that. And I walked in the same way. My gosh, one hour after I was in there, I was so excited. I had no idea, I, in my wildest imagination, that within three months, I would do a sinus lift. I still can't believe I did. In fact, I'll never forget the first sinus lift I did. I had a resting pulse of 140. I had to depend underwear on. I had more sweat on my head than my swimming pool. When it was all over, I passed down. There's blood all over my head. But I'll tell you what, it was the neatest thing I ever did. I never would have in a million years. Uh, Carl Mish, I tell Carl all the time, I said, you know what? Going to the Mish Institute, it was almost like I lived on the planet um, dental world for 35 years. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I discovered this island, the seventh continent called Australia Dental Implants. And what a, and see, but the AGD, the forefathers, they knew this would happen to this young kid named Howard because it was a structured. Don't always be so independent and do everything on your own. That's so typical of a solo practicing dentist or a Texan. You know, you give him an acre of land in the middle of nowhere. He builds a fence around it, gets a gun to protect it, flies on the Lone Star State, and all he does is intellectually and sexually inbreed with himself. Okay, well, you know, you send your kids to school to learn from others that have gone before you. And these elderly wise people that are 60 years old plus, when they're setting up these AGD requirements, they knew that they could with structure and with guidance, that if you would come in there, they would turn you on. So if you want to get practice management in the front door, you get your FAGD, your MAGD, and you'll learn all the practice management by learning endo, pediatrics, orthodontics, oral surgery, periodontal, prosthodontics. If you don't want to do that, then you got to go in the back door and you got to go to all the Sally McKenzie's and Kathy Jamison's and Linda Miles and Jennifer D. St. George. And it's a, it's a, it's almost like it, it's crazy. And what you ought to do if you really want to get there in the speed of light is do both. Attack the front door, the back door. I mean, ask any army. What happens if you attack someone from two sides? You slaughter them, okay? Tony Robbins always says success leaves clues. When an airplane takes off for another city, they're, they are off course 95% of the time. All they do is they keep adjusting off their last decision outcome. And what do they do? They land that airport. Isn't it funny how the shuttle will go around the planet like 40 times, and then it lands, it pulls up and stops on that X. Now, like, that's pretty cool. You're 180 miles off the ground, you know, 40 laps around the planet, and you land on an X. Um, the eight specialties of dentistry, you know, 5.9% are orthodontists of all the 161,000 dentists. 5.9% are orthodontists. 
3.8% are oral surgeon, 2.9% are periodontist, 2.2% are pediatrist, 2% are endodontist, 1.6% prosthodontist, 0.2% public health, that's a master's in public health degree, and 0.1% is oral pathology. That alone, those percentages should tell you where you should take the continuing ed. My gosh, you have almost 6% of the, of the dentist or orthodontist and only 0.1% are oral pathology. Once again, I go back to your last three years of continuing education. And you took all these oral biopsy courses and pulling out tongues and looking for capacity sarcoma and thrush. And because you have all these wild nightmares of all this weird stuff. And eventually it'll land you in front of the Supreme Court and you get penalized. And, there, and then 6%, which is basically 60 times greater than 0.1% oral pathology, is ortho. If 6% of the specialists are ortho, maybe you should learn orthodontics. If 4% or 3.8% are oral surgeons, maybe you should learn how to place implants and pull out a wisdom teeth. If almost 3%, 2.9% are periodontists, maybe you should learn something about gum disease. If 2.2% are pedodontists, maybe you should learn to work on kids. If 2% are endodontists, maybe you should learn how to do a root canal. A consumer-focused delivery system is not organized by dental specialties that are provider-focused. They are organized by patient requirements. Your consumer-oriented family practice dental office should contain all the resources necessary for the patient needs, wants, and desires. And if you do become consumer-focused and you can't provide all these services in-house, at least help with the structure relationship like, you know, like faxing the specialist your gosh darn treatment plan faxing him the referral you made, and when you're checking the patient out with your strategic, focus, sit down, ask the person. You know, I know his receptionist, Melinda. I've known her for six years. I go to lunch with her every couple months. You want me to get Melinda on the phone? Do you have any questions with her? The patients always do. They say, well, you know, I'm really stressed about going to another place because I don't know anybody over there. They won't know my name, and I'm really concerned because, you know, I had the x-rays taken here. Do I have to take them there again? Uh, I met my deductible here. Do I got to make my deductible there? <gasps> What's going to happen? I hate change. I want everything to be the same. So if you can't do it, Handle the relationship. Sit there and say, I know you want to go where everybody knows our name. And you know what? I know our name. And that's why the specialist quit sending cookies over to the general dentist. That's insulting when, you know, you send them a set of wisdom teeth every week for a year and you send them cookies. Send back patients that say, hey, the oral surgeon agreed with your treatment plan. He said, be sure to get that tooth crowned before it turns into a root canal. And you were right, Michelle. His Melinda was a sweetheart. I walked in there and she said to me, she says to me, you must be Susan from today's dental. And she's like, oh my God, how'd you know? Yada, yada, yada. So everything, your aptitudes determined by your attitude. Walk into practice management in the front door. Get your FAGD, your MAG, your diplomat and implants. Just do it.